So like Lacey said, um, we're going to let you know where to reach us at. Um, and then we're going to go through what the transition process is, what exactly that means, um, how do you plan for secondary transition, parent and student engagement, uh, the transition steps, what transition looks like in your child's IEP, and then we have some additional resources to share with you. Like Lacey said, she's Lacey. She can be reached at lroberts10 at bcps.org. And I'm Carol, and I can be reached at cevans9 at bcps.org. And then also each school has a transition facilitator assigned. Um, so you should have heard from them by now and have their email address. Um, but if you haven't, just let us know at the end and we can get you in touch with the person that works with your particular school that your child is in. And then also we can share a copy of the PowerPoint if you're interested um, once we're done. So the transition process is actually pretty complex. The overall goal of transition is to give positive student outcomes in their post-secondary placements. So what does a student want to do after high school? Do they wanna go in the military? Do they wanna go straight to work? Do they wanna go um, obtain some additional training? Do they need to get into to a technical school <laughs> program? And how do we merge the strengths that they have with the employment opportunities and um, things available in our area? We talk a lot in the younger grades about self-advocacy. We use data to inform our instruction. We set really high expectations for students. We try to involve families as much as possible. We monitor students for growth. We design instruction that is geared around experiences that are necessary to ensure uh, transitioning um, we give students agency linkage and community partnership information. We help to coordinate services. We help them learn about the different careers and programs that are offered. We talk about effective tools that they might need to overcome some obstacles, things they can do to better prepare themselves. Lots of those things go into creating um, data-driven um, positive outcomes for students. It's pretty lengthy, but that's why we start so early so that students can build upon their learning. Carol, do you have anything to add? Uh, not to that part. We'll get into each section of this as we go through the PowerPoint. Um, so if you have any questions about it, we are likely to give the information that you need on it. I would like if everybody could um, in the chat, just type what grade your uh, child is in, or if you're a job coach or um, you're attending for a certain profession, if you could just let us know, that way we can gear this a little bit more individually to each of you and make sure we get everybody covered. So like Lacey um, discussed in the last slide of everything that transition encompasses, um, the ultimate goal of it is to help students be successful once they graduate from high school. And it's not just something that we look at in their 12th grade year, it's an ongoing process from the time that the child turns 14 years old. And it's something that we work on and we refine and we develop new goals to match up with what the student is interested in. Um, and that's gonna change over the years, um, but we want them to be successful and have the skills that they need and have a plan going forward once they graduate so that they can be successful. And 
It covers employment, it covers education and training, and it can cover independent living skills. So how can you help your student have successful experiences post-secondary? There are some things you can do and there are some things you can foster in your student as you go through the next couple of years to help them be better prepared. So a lot of the conversations that we have with families happen at IEP meetings. So if you attend the IEP meetings and ask questions so that you are understanding the disability, you're understanding how it's impacting them in their educational careers, and you're understanding the transition um, goals that they have set for themselves, even at earlier grades, you can help foster uh, their experiences in the summer or in the evenings to help them make decisions. You can also better have an awareness of what they're saying to their teachers they want to be in case you have some differing opinions. You can talk about lots of things with them. We also are asking that parents and families encourage self-advocacy skills. We want you to start if you haven't already, encouraging your child to speak up for themselves and ask for the accommodations that they need. That's going to be something that's going to carry them through. If they have a question, have them ask the question. Have them be their um, own representative when they need something. Share experiences with them as often as possible. Obviously, nothing can replace going on to a job and doing a job. But at younger years, you can talk to them about different jobs that they may see. Talk to them about the grocery store workers. Talk to them about things that you see in your daily life. If you go across a bridge, you think you could work in water. Do you think you could, you could work on this bridge? Just have those conversations. Just open their worldview up because they're not often thinking about those things. They're, they might be thinking thinking about the day-to-day -day and not necessarily focus on what is going on around them and the people in their community that have jobs. So that would be rich experience for them and um, deepen your um, understanding of where they are with that. Another thing you can do is share with them um, things that they're interested in. If they, if they like bird watching, go out with them, watch some birds, do some things that they like to do so that you are better equip to have conversations when they come to you and say they want to be a, a, a botanist or they want to be something that may be not in your wheelhouse. And keep track of their educational records because as time goes on, things are going to change. Just like there's no way we could possibly expect a 14-year-old to know what they want to do. Some do, some don't, but it's not an expectation that we set. So as it changes over time, you can maybe see um, how they've developed and the things that they have grown through and areas where maybe the team might need to focus a little bit harder on as they age. Also encourage your student to explore options. Um, you know, some things, you know, talk to them. I always tell parents to talk to their kids about some of the outlandish jobs that you hear about. The underwater welder is, is one of my favorites to get kids talking about, you know, some of these um, jobs that are, uh, you know, hanging from scaffolding to wash windows and show them, show them that. Some of that will get them talking about uh, careers in a more fun, not heavy way where they're feeling oppressed. Encourage your, your student to be inquisitive about employment and ask questions of people that they know. What do you do for work? How's that going? What do you like about it? What do you not like about it? What is shift work? Why do we have shift work? All of those questions are things that you guys can have conversations about in the house. Also, students are expected to obtain uh, service learning hours through their their high school experience and they do get many of those through the curriculum that is offered however if you are in a position to have volunteer experience with them or have them do some things outside of the schoolhouse 
to gain, you know, like take them to a nursing home, let them walk around and see what the people do. Take them to a hospital, let them see what the people do there. Have some conversations about where there's needs in the world. Let them look while somebody is building a building and you're driving by. Just look in there, see what the people are doing. Could you could you run that machine? Do you think you could you could dig that big hole? What do you think? How do you think that looks in a day? Um, just to give them, and if you know anybody that has any jobs that they or might be interested in, uh, take them, see if it's appropriate, see if you can, you can get clearances and things to take them to, to some jobs. You know, even if you're taking them maybe to the docks just so they can watch the fishermen or take them to, um, like I said, a place where they're building that would be a really valuable experience if they're interested in construction. If they're interested in the arts, take them to some art museums and, and places where people are working, doing the things that they want to do. Do you have anything to add, Carol? Um, I did type some things in the chat for the volunteer hours. Um, 75 is the magic number for graduation. Like Lacey said, a lot of those hours can be earned. Um, it, with coursework that they do and, you know, social studies and history, they'll do some community projects and they can earn hours that way. Um, and then some other hours may have to be earned outside of the school building. And then I'll touch more on it with the educational records. When we start talking about different agencies that your student can work with, um, those agencies will ask for copies of the IEP and the psych eval, um, but I'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to those agencies. So for secondary transition, we always look at the end result and keep that in mind whenever we are developing goals and activities for the student. So um, the end result is what does your student want to do when they graduate? What do they want their career to be? Um, so we base what we put in the IEP based off what the student has identified as their end result. And we help them develop goals um, for them to be successful once they graduate. So with that goal setting, how are they gonna get there? What training is involved? Is college involved? Can they do an apprenticeship? Um, can they work at a position hands-on while they're studying um, in order to achieve those career goals? Um, and then we will set a course of study based off what they're interested in and we will develop activities based on their age and grade level to help them um, achieve these goals. So in middle school, Max, I know you said um, your child is in seventh grade. That's gonna look a lot different than in 12th grade. So if they say that they want to be a nurse, we will set goals for maybe determining what um, content areas you have to be strong in and what classes might need to be taken when registering for classes and um, what what the salary might be or things like that. And then when we get to the 12th grade year, we're going to get a little bit more in depth with it, like what colleges offer that program of study. What is the difference in pay between an LPN and an RN, things like that. And then to get all of this information and to help students set goals, uh, we give transition assessments. And this is where they identify the things that they like to do and don't like to, to do. Usually they're in the form of statements of, I like to work with my hands, or I like to read books. I work well with teams. I work better by myself. And then the results, of what your student said they prefer and they don't prefer matches them up with um, a career that seems to be the best fit. And hopefully those careers and what the student wants aligns. Um, if it doesn't, it's not the end of the world. It's just something to keep in mind. Um, 
because we want them to be happy doing whatever career they've chosen because potentially they're going to be doing it for the rest of their life. So we're going to start going over the parts of the IEP that are impacted by transition. So this may seem a little technical to you, but we thought it was important for us to spend some time going through what you see as different when your child turns 14 on their IEP. So you may notice on the present levels of academic achievement and functional performance, we call it the PLATH page, you may notice that there are some extra boxes on that page. And those boxes are going to be one which should be for employment, one should be for education and training, and where applicable, some independent living skills. Uh, we give students a survey where they uh, they answer questions like, what do they want to be after high school? Um, we ask them what their strength, what they think their strengths and weaknesses are. We ask them um, what they like to do, what they don't like to do, their volunteer experience. Do they have any hobbies? And then we also give them a transition assessment, like Carol said, that identifies preferences that they have in the earlier grades, things that they've been thinking about, and then more specific as they go through their, their high school career in order to align with students that um, to in order to make their, their career plan. So all of the information that we've gathered is listed there on that PLATH page. We also then on the, on the PLATH too, there's a second page where parents give their input. And typically we're looking for things like, do you think your child um, is going to be living independently? Do you agree that your child can be whatever it is they they set out to be. How do you feel um, about the 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 ideas that your child has? And we ask for a statement about about that. Um, and like Carol has said, we do this at the age of fourteen, but it's the calendar year that your child turns fourteen in the IEP. So say your child, your child could be 13 and get these services. It just depends on the year of the IEP date to date and when their birthday falls, whether they get those services at 13 or not. But that would be the reason is if they're turning 14 during the year of the IEP. So the next section you'll see on the IEP is post-secondary goals and outcomes. And these are the long range goals. What does the student expect to accomplish after they graduate high school? So what that career goal is that they stated, are they going to go straight into employment? Are they gonna, what type of education and training are they going to need? in order to do that position. Some may be going right into the career of their choice and getting that on-job training right away. Some might require a associate's degree. Some might you know, require, we have a lot of students that say they wanna be a lawyer or they wanna be a veterinarian as a popular one. And then they're not aware that it's eight years of college in order to earn that. So. Um, this gives us an opportunity to talk to them about their goals and make sure they really understand what is entailed in reaching those goals. So on the IEP, you might, it's going to be worded something like upon graduation from high school, the student will work in the field of, and for this example, construction and development as an electrician. Does anyone have questions so far? I don't want us to get so deep in and you lose your questions. If you have any or think of any along the way, you can put them in the chat and we will make sure that they get answered. So the course of study, you've heard us talk about that. It aligns courses that the students are taking to their post-secondary goals. It kind of says, what does the student need to be 
decent at in order to get where they where they want to go? Do they need to focus more on the sciences? Do they need to focus more on literature? Do they need to comprehensively improve their reading skills in order to get where they're trying to go? So we look at the at, at what they want to do and then we look at the courses that they're they're taking and we look at their plans and we talk with um them about the skills that they need. We also look at the overall um, technical aspect of, of what they want to do. What field is it in? Are there some other experiences that maybe the student might need to make a better decision? Are they saying they want to be an engineer, but they have no idea what kind of engineering they want to do? That would be something that we would go over there. Are they going to go straight to employment and they, they need like skills and training for that? Or are they going to go to a post-secondary institution where they have expectations of writing and reading? That makes a difference in how we program for our students as well. What classes do will they need to reach their goal? And how does what they're doing impact their future? Um, do we need them to, to really pay attention a little bit more to those writing skills if they want to get um, into college? Those are some of the conversations that this page typically brings up. I just want to add with that, um, this is where the magnet school options can come into play for our middle school and even ninth grade students, um, because some magnet schools will allow ninth graders to come in as a 10th grader. Um, and it's also important if your child is interested in a magnet school program that they look at the report card for the seventh grade year in the first quarter for the eighth grade year. So this seventh grade year is very important, especially if they're interested in a magnet school. Um, they have to apply by November um, for magnet programs of their eighth grade year. So when you submit the report cards, that first quarter of eighth grade is going to be the only one seen. So, and there are a lot of different programs. Um, there's, we have construction, I can't even list them all, like mathematics, engineering, construction, cooking, um, a lot of visual arts programs, graphic design, things like that. So I definitely recommend um, looking at the Magnet School website to see what options are available, but they can align very well in helping your child, if they're in middle school, decide if this is something that they really want to do or, you know, because they'll take the courses and be like, I love it. Or they'll be like, this isn't anything like I thought and I'm going to change my plan. Um, and then you, you will see on the IEP transition activity. So these are activities that are suggested for the student to complete within that IEP year. And all of the activities are intended to move the student closer to their post-secondary goals. So there will be um, an activity for employment and an activity for education. And in some instances, um, there might be an activity for independent living. And it will tie into what your child says they want to do when they graduate. So for example, they may write a resume and share it with the case manager related to the field of whatever they want to do, or write a cover letter and share it with the case manager related to getting a job in teaching. Um, and then they may explore colleges or create or trade schools related to the field of and then whatever that might be. So the resume one, I would probably put under education because they're going to need those English skills and that those reading and writing skills to write that resume. And then the exploring colleges and trade schools would apply to employment and their goal of whatever they want to do. So you'll see two transition activities at least, and the case manager keeps track of them quarterly. So you can see if your student has done them or not. 
they go home with quarterly reports and it will say whether they completed it and in what method, who did they report to, is it ongoing or have they not initiated it yet? And the annual goals, we do something with their annual goals as well. We try to be sure that what they're working on for their future career plans is also linked to what they're, they're trying to work on in the classroom. So for example, if they have a written language goal, we try to do their transition activities in a written form to try to support the work that they're doing in the classroom with um, their their IEP objectives. So when you see, when you're looking at their annual goals at the top in, in gray, in like a gray bar, you'll see either education or employment checked for many students on their goals. That means that's the goal we're trying to address as we also address the transition activities. Another piece you'll see on the IEP and that you'll care much more about as your child gets older is the age of majority. So the age of majority is the legal age that a person is considered an adult and that's 18 in Maryland. In Maryland though, if you have a child that has an IEP, that decision-making does not automatically transfer to your child when they turn 18. Those educational rights remain with you until they graduate. So we will go over that with you um, during the IEP year. They will discuss it in the IEP meetings. Um, again, it will matter more if your child turns 18, you know, later in high school, just know that those educational rights remain with you. Agency linkage is where we try to connect uh, our community partners with families as appropriate. There are several in, in Baltimore County, we're pretty fortunate. There are several um, different organizations that try to link with families. And some things students are entitled to receive based on um, their, their, their services and others they have to be eligible for. Most of the services that they're going to get post-secondary, they're going to have to be eligible for it. They're going to have to go through an application process. They're going to have to meet certain criteria in order to receive them. It's not just like their K-12 education where they get that based on their disability. They're going to have to seek out some of these community partners. So that's going to be the important thing there. Normally, we don't connect families um, until they're the summer of their eighth grade year. There's there's a program called Doors Priets where students can start learning some basic job skills through the Doors program that we we connect people with just because they have such a, a large number of people that they're servicing. We try to, to focus on those that are closest to going to um, their post-secondary plans, but normally they would do um, an application and have to submit some documentation. The big thing to remember when you are ready to connect with these outside agencies is that you follow up because a lot of families we see, we go through and we show them we show them the process that is um, the the initial, and then they make the the doors office will make a contact uh, with a family, and then there's no follow up, and unfortunately that kicks them off of the list because they're so busy. So once you make that contact, you're going to want to look for that letter you get in the mail. You're going to want to connect with. Um, them as soon as they send that so that you remain eligible um, to have those conversations with them. You don't want to get, get bumped off the list for something like that. So we've listed um, the main agencies um, that you'll come into contact with. Uh, Lacey talked about DOORS and the pre-employment transition services. 
They also work with students in placing them in internships a lot of times over the summer. And um, this is in high school, um, but when we've had students that have really loved their placement and the employer has really loved them, so they've stayed on and uh, would work part-time during the school year if they chose to, just opens up the uh, opportunities for them and works with uh, the students on their soft skills uh, to help them get into the workforce. And then there's also another part of a division of rehabilitation services, and that's vocational rehabilitation and student employment services. And this is for um, students that may have more significant disabilities. Um, they may have more um, independent um, living skill needs and uh, VR and SES will work with these students to um, help them get those skills. It may be like bus transportation in order to get to work. It may be a job coach that goes with that student to work to help guide them along the way and make sure um, that they grow the skills that they have to be successful in that job. And then we also have the Developmental Disabilities Administration, DDA. Um, they can coordinate services um, to help um, people with more significant disabilities um, be included in the community. Um, and a lot of what they do is assisting in helping people um, gain competitive employment. Um, if you have a student who is outside of gen ed classes, um, then your transition facilitator will most likely recommend um, DDA services um, and they can assist with the application that needs to be filled out. It's a little intense. Um, for doors, just to go back, um, your transition facilitators can also um, refer you to doors also. Um, if you're interested, you can reach out to them and just let them know that you would like to be referred and they can make that happen. Um, and for these two places is really where that saving of the documents comes in because working with doors, they're gonna ask for the student's latest IEP. They're gonna ask for the latest educational assessment um, just so that they can match up and individualize the services that they provide to what your students' needs are. Typically, we refer students for doors in ninth grade. Um, doors really opens the door to a lot of other resources in the county. Um, in particular, uh, a lot of apprenticeship programs that require a doors referral to get into them. Um, so we really strongly encourage everyone to sign up and meet with a counselor um, to help figure out what resources might be available and utilize the specific resources that they have. Lacey, did you want to add anything? There's something I know I'm forgetting. So these services aren't costly to families they are based on need and they are uh they're they're free services that are based on your your eligibility we also have the services through behavior health administration this is for people who have mental um, illnesses or drug and alcohol um, concerns, they would need to use their personal insurance or Medicaid because there is a cost associated with those. Additionally, we have the Maryland Department of Labor, um, and they offer a workforce development center where you can go in and, and gain some skills. You can um, work toward your education and employment goals. They have the American Job Centers, which is phenomenal. Uh, you can go in there and they, they can help you search for jobs or write resumes. And, and the WIOA office, um, the, the WIOA Act um, is um, 
who they're working through. The Maryland Department of Labor does a really nice job of compiling a lot of resources for um, people in general in the state um, to access career opportunities. And I do want to add that the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act is um, where a lot of the apprenticeship apprenticeship programs come through. So if your child isn't loving a school environment and doesn't really want to attend college, this is a great site to look on to see what apprenticeship opportunities are available and also kind of some uh, shorter on the job training type things. There are a ton in there. A lot of times those referrals have to come through doors. So you have to work through doors in order to access some of these apprenticeships through WIO. And, and through that, I just put in the chat for those that are looking for that right away. I just put the link in for that. So we added some additional resources um, just to help navigate um, transition and what it means, what it looks like. We could spend days going over all the nuances of transition. We just wanted to give you a brief overview. Um, but the National Collaborative on Workforce and Disability has a lot of information and a lot of really good resources on once your child gets into the workforce, um, what that looks like with their disability. Do they have to let the employer know that they have a disability? Um, different things like that, that they can take into consideration. Accommodations that may be available on the website um, and that may be available to them in whatever field that they're interested in. Um, there's the National Secondary Transition Technical Assistance Center. Uh, PACER is one of my favorites. A ton of information on transition and employment. Um, they also have uh, different resources if your child's considering going to college. Think College does that also. Um, Again, like we said, the whole point of transition is to help make sure they're successful once they graduate. And once they graduate, it doesn't mean that they may not get accommodations anymore. They are just going to have to seek out those resources more than they did in middle and high school. So most colleges do have um, an accommodations um, student service center that they can bring their IEP into and they will go through it and say, okay, you, we provide these accommodations in college and they will send out a form for the teachers so that they're aware um, and things like that. And the same with the workforce. And all of this really ties in together with that self-advocacy piece and those goals we're setting and the academic goals that they're working on it all um, works together to help your student be successful. So we're gonna open it up now for some questions um, from you guys. We wanna hear what you're thinking about this and uh, if you have any questions that we can help you answer. <coughs> Anyone have anything? I do want to add that you will receive a transition planning guide um, every year um, for your students that get transition services. And I do recommend reading that. There are great suggestions for what you can do for your child during certain ages um, to help prepare them. Yes, Kathy? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm on my phone, so I don't have. Can you hear me? We yeah. can. Okay. Um, I don't have a thing. I can't find where the chat is to type a question. <laughs> okay. So, um, the question that I have is what age should um, a child start applying for or looking at DDA services? I have a child that's in ninth grade right now. 
So I'm trying to, I mean, I'm not even really sure what that is. He's in a, he's not in gen ed. So he's in a FALS program. So there's, no. go, go ahead, Carol. Go ahead. <laughs> I would recommend starting that process now. Um, oh, there are waiting lists with some of the resources that are available. Um, and the application for DDA is quite lengthy. Um, your transition facilitator for your student can definitely walk you through that and give you tips and tricks um, in filling out the application. Um, okay. But I would do it this year just because there are waiting lists for programs that can be a few years long. Okay, so I should do it this year. Yes, ma'am, as yeah. soon as possible. Okay, and uh, you said something earlier in the presentation about your transition facilitator at your child's school yes. being able to help you with that application. Yes. Um, where can I find out where who the tr transition facilitator is? Because my student is new to this school this year, so I, I, I don't even know her name or have not met her. Can you share what middle school? He said Delaney school High School. So that's me. I am oh, in there. Almost he's in Fowles. Oh, he's in Fowles. I'm sorry. That's I, the Fowles, I believe, is Will Strickland. Okay. Is he? Um, who is the um, um, transition facilitator? Do they, they work? in the school system, they work for the county. Yeah. I'm trying to like, are they a teacher? We work, no. for the we work for the school system. I am the um, the diploma one for Delaney High School. Okay. I, I, I'm there pretty not the regularly. Certificate. I'm not the certificate, but if you send me an email, I believe it's it's Will Strickland, but I wanna check that and send it to you, send you his information electronically because I don't okay. keep them all in my head. So if you would, wouldn't would mind L. Roberts 10, just shooting me over an email yeah. um, and I'll get that information to you. Um, in okay. The I'll do uh, that. Great. Can I can I just let in here um, that usually the transition facilitators become involved um, with the students and with the work program and also um, when the annual review comes up. So they should be sending if they have your email. If we don't have your email, then they, they don't get a lot of you don't you won't get a lot of stuff. But we have a whole lot of. Um, you know, parent presentations that they would send it. And if there was some kind of special event from out in the community happening over the weekend, they could send you that for students with disabilities. Um, so, you know, the fact that you haven't heard isn't horrible, but the fact that, you know, you are interested and you're a parent that is this, that wants to do what's right um, at this point in time. Yeah, I would reach out. It's Will Strickland. S T R I C K L A N D at bcps.org. He doesn't have a number. So it's W Strickland. Um, and he will get back to you. And you said it was S T R I C K L A N D? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. And what do you typically question. need in order to apply for DDA? the application what like documents would i need obviously his like current iep I'm, I'm assuming yes it's the iep and any um doctor's notes doctor's reports that you have if he receives ot pt um speech language services um behavioral services um maybe the well, that list. wouldn't that all be on his iep well, not, not necessarily, not in depth. Yeah, it, it the, the report would actually give much more in depth information than just the fact that he gets those services in the IEP. Okay. For example, if a student had a behavior problem um, that impacted his ability to stay on task, it might say that the student has a behavior that is impacting his ability to stay on task and the teachers need to remind him to pay attention, but it might not say that he's taking 30 milligrams of X medicine for this long and he needs X, Y, and Z. Okay. I mean, because my son only sees the pediatrician, but he doesn't 
you know, he's not up to date really on any of what he's capable of and whatnot. That would be more the occupational therapist and the speech therapist at school and the sure. educator. So I'm not sure, sure what kind of doctor's reports I would need or I don't even have anything. Well, you know, a lot of a lot of kids would would go to Kennedy Krieger and they, they get services through other agencies. And, you know, they're more in-depth reports, um, neuropsychologicals and all that. So I'm, I was just saying, if you had those, it doesn't mean you have to have a doctor's thing, you know. Um, but any reports that kind of give a big picture of what your child needs and, and what's recommended to help them is what's important. That's what they're looking for. Um, when you apply to DDA, you know, in the school system, we often make the student look wonderful. They can do all these great things. And we, we don't necessarily focus always on the negative or what's lacking. But with DDA, if, if they're going to fund you, you have to talk about your child as it as if it is their worst day. <laughs> sure. You know, no, so, I, I, obviously the, the, the county sugarcoats everything. Yes. On, I, yes. <laughs> I've been through all of this. So. Okay. <laughs> you know what I'm saying then. Um, but yeah, but Will can Will can walk you through it and and help you with the application. Um, you know, help let you know exactly what kind of documentation you're going to need and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and we, we'll get the ball rolling for you. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Great questions. Please, if you have any more, let us know. I know we went over a lot of information. So as the night goes on or the week goes on and questions pop up, please don't hesitate to reach out to Lacey or I, and we will definitely get back to you. Um, I know um, Mr. Yin had, had um, asked the question about um, you know, the age of 21. In Maryland, um, a student can only remain in school until the age of 21 through his 21st year. Um, so if the student is earning a diploma, they could graduate at 18, 19, 20, or 21, depending on what their needs are and how long they're staying. Our certificate students don't graduate, they exit. So upon exiting the system, they too can leave at 18, 19, 20, and 21. But at age 21, they have to leave. And if, if they leave earlier, then DDA services normally do not kick in until the age of 21. So if your child exits the system at 18 or 19, basically there are no services, no education, there's nothing being provided during that two-year period. And then if you would move, DDA wouldn't have your updated information and you would not get services through DDA because they couldn't contact you. So that's the other reason why we often will say diploma bound students graduate and usually around 18 or 19, depending on their age and you know what they need, what credits they need. Um, but our certificates students exit the system and they can stay until you know, only up up through their 21st, 21st birthday. We also had a question in the chat about recordings and where they'll be available. So I uploaded the um, transition um, website for Baltimore County. And if you click that link, it should take you directly to our transition page. And there are um, several presentations that we've already given um, for this year, some from last year are there for you 